All right, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to be talking about conserved constraints on brain network structure and dynamics, but I noticed that several of the previous speakers were um, bringing out their favorite quotes for why mathematics uh, is either really beautifully related to the physical world or not, depending on your perspective. Um, and so I thought I would throw up this one, which is one of my favorites from Joseph Glanville in his um, The Vanity of Dogmatizing from 1661, where he says, but how is it and by what art doth the soul read that such an image or stroke in matter signifies such an object? Did we learn such an alphabet in our embryo state? And how comes it to pass that we are not aware of any such cognate apprehensions? That by diversity of motions we should spell out figures, distances, magnitudes, colors, things not resembled by them, we attribute to some secret deductions. And I think part of what we are all here to do today is not perhaps to have secret deductions, but to have open deductions about what the secrets really are. So um, I'm going to start with the central nervous system of several different animals. This one obviously is the human, and just note that it displays incredibly rich network architecture. And within that network architecture, these structural links constrain the propagation of activity in a matter that specifically depends upon the link topology. And therefore, understanding the constraints that that network architecture has um, and which of them are actually conserved across species is critical for our continued progress in understanding and treating um, neurological and psychiatric disease. So it doesn't just matter understanding the large-scale human, but also animal models from which we gather much of what we know about neurological uh, and psychiatric disease. So just as a few preliminaries before we get into some of the data that I want to show you, um, I'm going to be treating each of these uh, species, or the connectomes of each of these species as a network. And in this case, I'm going to be showing you a couple different adjacency matrices. So they will be n by n matrices, where every element in this matrix tells you the strength of connectivity between region I and region J, or node I and node J. And one of the fundamental questions that we have to begin with is what are the simple principles of network connectivity across different um, neural systems? And I'll spend most of my time talking about these four animals. Um, so here is uh, the mesoscale connectome of the mouse from the Allen Brain Institute. Here is um, the mesoscale connectome of Drosophila from imaging. Then we have macaque connectivity from track tracing, and then two different connectomes from the healthy adult human, one at a lower resolution and one at a higher resolution. I will note that these are um, non-invasive images, and they are from diffusion magnetic resonance imaging, and then tractography algorithms applied to that imaging, so that's non-invasive, um, whereas the macaque and the mouse are invasive track tracing measurements. So I just want to note that because these are very different methods of acquiring the same sort of data from different species. But we see, despite that difference in approach, we see very similar um, structural phenotypes. So on the um, bottom row here, what you see is the weight of each connection as a function of the connection's distance. And you see a negative trend in the mouse, in Drosophila, in the CAC, and in both the, the um, human connectomes as well. And what this suggests is that the strongest, or what it indicates is that the strongest connections are the ones that are relatively short, and then the weakest connections are the ones that are relatively long. Um, and so in a very simplistic way, we could start by stating some candidate conserved principles, with the first one being physical expanse is costly. And therefore, that's why we see that most of the connections in, across these different organisms are relatively short. Um, and I'll say that that's relatively simple. Um, but let's stay there for a second before we get more complicated. And if we wanted to construct a very simple generative model that would explain those observations, we could start with something like this, which is the principle of small worldness, where you have a network organization, and this is particularly a, a well-known figure from the Watson Strogatz 1998 Nature paper, where they showed um, a generative model that takes you from a regular lattice graph uh, to a random graph uh, by rewiring the connections here. Uh, and here is the increasing randomness, so the probability of rewiring. In the middle, you go through a small world regime where you have um, lots of local clustering of connectivity and then a few long distance connections. Um, so this would be consistent, this sort of architecture would be consistent with the previous slide that I showed you, where you're going to have many short paths and only a few um, long paths. Now, one um, interesting prediction of this model is that it suggests long-distance connections are placed randomly 
throughout the system. So I'd like to first test that prediction. Are long distance connections placed randomly throughout neural systems? You probably already know the answer, but here's some data to support the answer, which is, of course, no. Long distance connections are not placed randomly throughout neural systems, and therefore the simple small world, small world model is not a particularly elucidating uh, model here. So to walk you through this, what we did is that we calculated the similarity between node I's uh, connectivity profile and node J's connectivity profile. And if long distance links were placed um, at random, then we would see very little correlation or little similarity between the long distance connections of I and the long distance connections of J. So here is that mean cosine similarity between I's connectivity profile and J's connectivity profile as a function of how long the uh, connections are. So these are the 5% very longest connections, then the 10% longest connections, 20%, and then 25%. So as we go to the right, we go to slightly shorter connections. And in the colored bars, you see the values for the true animals. So again, mouse, Drosophila, macaque, and two humans. And then in the gray bars, you see um, the null model. So what would be expected if these had been placed uh, um, more randomly. And what you can see consistently is that the colored bars are higher than the gray bars, which indicates that there's a lot of um, shared, there's a lot of shared, similarity between the connectivity profile of node I and node J, particularly for long distance connections. So that indicates that these are not spread randomly throughout the system, but have some shared variance. They're there for some sort of reason. So one of the questions is, what is the rule? What is that shared reason that helps to explain where the long distance connections are placed across these systems? Um, and to answer that question, we sort of posited a relatively reasonable hypothesis, I think, which is that long distance connections perhaps are placed so as to support a diversity of brain dynamics. So we can start with that structural connectome that I just showed you earlier, and then we can simulate dynamics upon it. In this case, we used a very simple linearization of a Wilson-Cohen oscillator model. And then from that simulated dynamics, you can extract a covariance matrix, or what some in the field call a functional connectivity matrix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, there, I tried to do it continuously, so here are the 5% longest than the 10% longest, which include the 5%, right? But they get shorter and shorter as you go. Um, and yeah, for some of these cases, you'll notice that the, um, for some individuals, so for example, for the macaque, you can see that the effect is largest for the longest connections and not as strong for the shortest, shorter connections. Um, Okay, so we're going to ask whether these long distance links are placed so as to, to support a diversity of brain dynamics, and we're doing that by simulating dynamics on top of the structure and then estimating a covariance matrix from the simulated time series. Now from that simulated uh, covariance matrix, we then calculate how um, connected any particular region is to multiple modules within the brain. And so that's what I'm indicating here. This region here, I, uh, has connections to the red module, many connections to the red module, many connections to the or orange module, the yellow one, a little bit to the green one, and z practically zero to the uh, blue one. Whereas this region over here has all of its connections located inside of the green module where it sits. So the difference between the red region and the green region is that the red region has a high participation to lots of different modules throughout the system, whereas the green region has very low participation. It only um, has, a, has covariance with other regions it's inside of its module. So what we'd like to do is to estimate um, this participation coefficient as a function of um, deleting those long distance links. <clears throat> so if we remove long distance links, that's what I'm showing you here on the uh, <coughs> x-axis. So this is removing the 5% strongest links and then the 10% strongest links and the 20%, et cetera. Um, and then on the y-axis, I'm showing you the mean participation coefficient. And what you can see is that consistently in the colored bars, when we remove these long distance connections, it consistently reduces the participation coefficient from the baseline. This dashed red line is the baseline. The colored bars are always falling off from the baseline. And so what that is indicating is that these long distance connections, when you delete them, it decreases the um, 
the functional participation of these regions across different modules. In gray, what I'm showing you is when you delete the short distance connections. And in that case, what you see naturally, I think, or intuitively, is that the participation coefficient goes up, which means that when you delete these um, local connections, you get more connectivity to ac spread across many different functional modules in the system. So I think that that suggests a um, principle number two, or at least a candidate to conserve principle number two, which is that biological systems will pay a fee for these long distance connections in exchange for functional diversity. Um, but I want to ask whether that's enough. Um, functional di diversity is sort of a tricky notion to quantify, and I want to see if we can come up with a, a more a precise structural predictor. So I'm going to ask the question uh, of, are there relatively simple rules for precisely where these long distance connections are placed? And I'm going to try to bring us closer to the information processing capacities of the system. So here what we have is beyond the small world model that I started with, this is what we would call a modular model of a neural system, which is where you have um, strong, uh, strongly connected modules here that have some long distance connections among them. So that would be one candidate rule for placing long distance connections. Perhaps I need to place long distance connections to connect two different modules to one another. If that's the case, then your adjacency matrix will look like this. So you'll have strong block diagonal structure, and then you'll have a few long distance links between the modules indicated by these sparse colors in the off-diagonal blocks. And what's nice about this um, candidate model is that the modules will allow for local information processing, and then the long distance links will allow for more global information processing or sharing information across different modules. However, I have to admit that I also find this model less than satisfying. And the reason is that I think there are many distinct architectures that facilitate different types of information processes, and that perhaps we should be thinking about a diversity of motifs that support information um, processing and transmission. So here is that modular model again for you. But I want you to notice that it does not allow for two other important types of information um, processes. The first one is information transmission, which can really be structurally supported by bipartite structure, where you have um, information that may be present in this module and then shuttled immediately over to this module. Um, and the same with these two here. The way that this shows up in an adjacency matrix is by strong off-diagonal structure. So you see a lot of the colors here in the adjacency matrix are present in off-diagonal blocks, and that is the, the um, the, the uh, manifestation of bipartite structure. But even if we had information integration and segregation from the modules, and we had the potential for a transmission, it still misses this bit, which is I also think is very important for neural systems and other sy biological systems more generally, which is the potential to broadcast and receive information from the rest of the system. So it allows for um, much more, um, some centralization. So that type of process is supported by the structural motif of core periphery structure, which is illustrated on the left here. I have a dense um, core that has many strong internal connections, and then I have a relatively sparse periphery of nodes that aren't necessarily strongly connected to one another, but are very strongly connected to the core. So this core periphery structure allows for the core to gather information from the periphery, but also to broadcast information to the periphery as well. And how you see that in the adjacency matrix is shown here on the right-hand side. So you have a strong um, block in, at one spot, and then that block has connectivity to the rest of the system, but there's not a, a lot of connectivity among those um, periphery blocks themselves. Okay, so here are three different distinct architectures that each facilitate diverse information processes. Now, what would happen if we had a system that had all of those in it together at once? What would the connectivity look like? Um, and here is an example. So here's an example of an adjacency matrix where we have core periphery structure, um, we have bipartite structure, and then we have these is this isolated module structure as well. 
we can detect that kind of structure not using the traditional community detection techniques that have been used for networks previously, but using what are called um, stochastic block models, which their goal is to take an adjacency matrix like this and to find where should I place these white lines, so where should I demarcate the boundaries of blocks such that the probability of connectivity inside of a block is relatively uniform. So I can have strong connectivity inside here and weak connectivity inside here, that's fine, as long as within a given block the probability of connectivity is, is relatively homogeneous. Um, so what we can do is that we can take that stochastic block model approach and apply it to the connectomes that I just showed you and ask where are these lines of demarcation placed and then does that help us to explain the function or the genetic architecture of the systems. So here you can see um, two examples of that approach. So on the left hand side what I'm showing you is that we took that structural connectome, the mesoscale connectome from the mouse, again from the Allen Brain Institute, and we applied the stochastic block model to identify where these white lines should be. And then what I, we are doing is placing in color um, the pattern of gene co-expression between these regions. And so what you can see is that the white lines defined purely from structure really nicely isolate areas or combinations of brain regions that share similar gene expression patterns. And then on the right hand side you see another example. So here is the structural connectivity of the human brain and we apply the weighted stochastic block model to identify where these white lines should be. And then in color what you are seeing is a pattern of covariance in dynamics or in activity of the brain over time. And again what you can see is that the white lines that are defined based on structure nicely demarcate sectors of sets of brain regions that share um, similar time series. Yes? We are looking for both of these. They are larger scale than we would be able to assess whether it's neurons or glia. On the right hand side it is um, bold fMRI measurements. Oh, um, yes, I believe that they are. Um, okay, so that brings me to asking whether I need to revise, perhaps, um, my candidate principle number two, which is, um, so biological systems will pay a fee in ex for these long distance connections in exchange for functional diversity, but maybe we can be more precise and say that that's actually for informational diversity. Um, that these long distance connections allow for a diverse set of information processing capacities including this broadcast and receipt, the segregation and integration of information, and then the um, shuttling or transmission that bipartite structures allow. But, you know, we could continue on this line of inquiry and we could say let's isolate all of the possible rules that are shared across these species um, that help us to explain what we observe, but we would always have to come back to this realization that in fact biological systems are not just explained by these optimal principles that we love to think about from evolution, um, but also by history and happenstance, which has come up a few times over the course of this morning. And so I think even there's a limit to how far we can go in explaining what we are currently observing from optimal choices in a given time with sort of ignoring history. And therefore I think that there is merit to moving beyond explaining the network that we observe and rather explaining how that network impinges on system function. And perhaps there are conserved principles there that would be useful for us to understand. Um, so I'm going to now move to the last part of the talk where I'd like to say how does the network architecture that exists, it's a combination of beautiful optimization and history and happenstance, but it exists, how does that network architecture that exists impinge on the system's um, function? So one way that we can start to answer that question in a relatively simplified framework is to say, well, let's take this system and let's um, simplify it down to a linearization. So this is probably for neural systems, this is a linearization around an operating point of the system. 
we'll say that the linear, linear system is given by x dot equals ax plus bu, where a is the adjacency matrix that I've just been telling you about. And then b is a matrix that along the diagonal has elements that tell you which regions have energy injected into them, and u is the actual energy that is being injected. Then we are going to study the state transition from an initial state x0 to a final state xt. And we'd like to ask how much energy needs to be injected into the system in order to move it from x0 to xt. We'll define a simple cost function, probably the simplest one that we can imagine initially, which is a quadratic penalty of the input. So that's given here. This is the total energy. Um, and then we, from that, we can write down the controllability Gramian of the system, which, as you can see, is a function of both the adjacency matrix, so the actual structural connections of the system, but also the B matrix, which along the diagonal has which elements have energy being injected into it. From that construction, we can then derive the minimum energy that is required to push the system from x0 to xt, and that's given by this expression here, which, as you can see, is a function of the controllability Gramian, as well as the initial and final states. And I'll just note that this energy term um, is useful because it, again, brings us back to information in some sense, because the available states, so x0, xt, all xts that you might want to go to, those available states and the available state transitions define the information production capacity of the system. OK, so what we'd like to do is to take that structural formalism and say, what is it about a network architecture that supports its control, which can be endogenous control, allowing it to move between many different states, um, producing information? So what we can do is that we can take the entire full network, although doing analytics on the full network is really difficult. So we actually simplified the system and said, let's imagine that we have a set of driver nodes where we can inject energy, and we would like to control the activity profile of these non-driver nodes in blue. And so what that amounts to in the adjacency matrix is that here's the full Drosophila network, for example, and what we're only going to study is this bipartite structure down here, which is just the connections from the driver nodes to which we define, and then to the non-driver nodes, which we define. I'm not going to go through derivations here because it's obviously too short of a period of time, but in the paper we derive the precise estimates for the energy that is required to move the system to different states when you can inject energy into these driver nodes. Um, it's a function of a couple things, but I want you to just focus on the fact that the determinant of Q is here is in the denominator, and Q is this A21 uh, subgraph times A21 transpose. Now, the fact that the determinant of Q is there in the denominator actually very nicely gives us a geometric intuition for what it is about a network that allows it to have many different um, state transitions. And I'll walk you through that very briefly here. So here's our example toy network. And then here what you have is three different examples for the weights that could be placed on those edges between the driver nodes and the non-driver nodes. And then here in this last column, you see the determinant of Q. So if the determinant of Q is large, then the energy is going to be small. Um, and if the determinant of Q is small, then the energy is going to be large. So this is the case where the energy is actually very small, and this is the case where the energy is very large. Um, and the reason is that if I actually want to change these non-driver nodes, having direct connections from the driver to the non-driver allows me to just inject energy in a red one, it goes straight to the blue one, we're done. I can control it perfectly, right? Whereas if I have a lot of this um, sort of... Um, similar weights into the same regions, um, that makes it actually very difficult to control because as soon as I inject energy in here, it's going to go to both places with roughly the same amount and um, then it's going to be difficult to control one versus the other. So the take home here, well, number one, just bringing that, that geometric intuition home, is that the edge weights that maximize the volume of this parallelotope are large in magnitude and orthogonal with one another. And so therefore, Having a connectome where you have dissimilarly distributed weights on edges from very strong to zero um, into these non-drivers decreases the energy that is required for control. To bring that back to the conservation across species, we can actually stack up three of the species that we talked about before. So here's Drosophila, here's the mouse, and here's the human. And we can order them precisely by this um, energetic 
requirement on the, on the network, and we can find that the Drosophila connectome is less favorable um, for control. The mouse is kind of in the middle, and then the human has a network topology that is most favorable for control. So that brings us to a possible principle number four, which is that evolution and history create these networks that then define the system's energetics. And um, I think there are interesting questions about when we actually come to these networks, how much of the variance that is present here is explained by these simple physical principles, the principle of that expanse is costly, um, but that biological systems will pay for it, a fee for it in exchange for informational diversity, versus this history and happenstance. So is it possible that there's some rule that explains that would allow us to predict how much variance is explained here and how much variance should be due to history and happenstance. Um, and then even if we were to get that far, um, can we understand the energetic requirements of the given system as it stands? And so I guess as I was thinking about where a sort of research program would go or the open questions that I have in my mind in considering some of these data, um, and it's sort of the first few years that I've been thinking about cross-species analysis, so this is relatively new for me, um, is that perhaps we, we are interested in searching for universality and why? Because that we feel that that suggests to us that we have understood something. If something is universal, then perhaps it is more fundamental and therefore we have understood something. Um, to, to search for universality, I think it, often it's useful to begin by identifying conserved constraints. And because I am trained as a physicist, I think that many of the true constraints, even in biological systems, are physical constraints. Um, and that I think often there's a lot of discussion about how biological systems are so different than physical ones. But in fact, many of the very, very simple, very striking um, structures that we see in biological systems can be explained by very simple physical principles. If we are going to identify these conserved constraints, we need to isolate what those physical variables are. And the ones that I think come to mind when I consider this result is that perhaps there is a physical constraint or a physical variable which is how much energy do I need to expend now when I'm a system, and we want to relatively minimize that, or at least biological systems seem to want to minimize how much energy they want to expend now. And that's perhaps why we have relatively short connections in our nervous systems. But then I think we also need to isolate these information variables because that is where we get this converse, which is perhaps we're willing to pay something for informational diversity, but we also can get into this area, which is where the networks that we actually have have informational capacity, but that informational capacity is, has energetic constraints on it too. So is it possible that the information variables are really just energy variables again? But they're not energy variables necessarily that I have to pay today. They may be energy variables that I, need, that I will be paying for the next many years of the organism's life or over more evolutionary timescales. And so I actually wonder if we could um, boil both of these down into a continuum of the energy requirements now, clearly isolated by physical variables, and the energy required later, which is more relevant to information variables. Uh, and perhaps that would simplify some of the theories that we have. Okay, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Do you, do you think concepts like uh, in, informational diversity can help explain brain disorders? Um, yes. <laughs> can you elaborate? That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> How, <laughs> can you say more about that? Um, yeah, so certainly there are, so what we have done is that we've taken this approach to understand the energetics that are required for a system to reach different states. And we can do that as a function of, um, of uh, disease. So in bipolar disorder, for example, we see a decrement in the energy, um, the capacity for the system to exert control with a similar amount of energy. So it requires more energy, in other words. We can also show that there's a change in the energy requirements for this type of control with development. So as kids grow from the age of eight to the age of 22, you actually, in normative development, you require less energy to do a lot of this diverse transitioning than you did when you were eight 
Um, and that is correlated, individual differences in that measurement are correlated with individual differences in cognitive control, which is one of the um, human capacities that is most altered uh, transdiagnostically across psychiatric conditions. Um, so there's uh, two pieces of evidence that suggest the yes. Um, I think there's more to do, though. Okay, so my question uh, has to do with function. So uh, I remember the uh, experiments, that, when these experiments were published on human brain, they are, as I remember, white matter. And uh, long distance connections were reported at that time. But uh, the function of these connections uh, remains a mystery, at least to me. Do you have any idea, just any ideas, about what those long distance things might do? And in particular, what would happen if you experimentally clipped them? Um. Well, there, I think, I don't know if the question is specifically to human or across lots of species. What I try to focus on here is, are there principles for the placement of long distance connections across species, which I think is different than a particular long track in the human, um, may have a explanation that's not um, broadly applicable across the species. If there is, there are, I mean, one of the long tracks is the corpus callosum. That was the one um, I was going to mention. That one okay. you know. Yeah, that one we know. You, be, you become a split personality when that one's cut. And the left hand literally doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Um, but that's just one. Uh, does anybody have any plans to, to find out? You need to cut them and to see what happens? Um, I, th I think there are ethical considerations with humans, at least, for that. Um. Oh, I know just who I want to do it on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to, to make a comment. So basically, the main hypothesis about these long-term uh, range tracks is that they synchronize different brain regions. And in fact, uh, in MS, uh, where the myelination is reduced and the speed of uh, those axons is reduced, you know what happens in, uh, in MS. So, so maybe it is true that they synchronize uh, uh, regions at large distances. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think synchronization is, de is an important component of this, but I also think, I mean, there are two, at least in human, there are, there are two bodies of literature. One that focus on oscillatory rhythmic activity and synchronization, and then another that focuses on discrete states of the brain and then transmission of discrete pieces of information from one region to another. Um, and so I think that it's interesting to ask the question of, I, I think both occur in the brain, and I think that's what most people would agree as well, but um, how how the two are existing at the same time, they actually require very different models. You need a dynamical system to, to um, understand the synchronization properties. You need a more discrete system to understand the binary information computations. How does that all align at once, um, I think is an open question. And then how, perhaps that is again another way of allowing us to ask questions about what are the network architectures that support synchronization of dynamical systems, but that also support these more um, discrete processes, too. David? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, so I want to ask about, and it's come up, put this in relation to some of the other questions, the source of the similarities. So there are sort of three, I guess, broadly speaking, right? So one is they have a common evolutionary, and the fly's a bit of a confound, but they have a common evolutionary history. It's not a surprise that they have common topological structures, one. The second would be that there's some developmental program that all neurons have, right? And so the fact they find themselves in a the brain is neither here nor there, but they have a growth, sort of growth rules, and those growth rules tend to lead to similar structures beehives and so on. And the third is that the world has a structure that the brain respects. And I'm just wondering, what, you know, along the lines of some of the earlier remarks that Sam made and so on. So 
Do you, are there ways of teasing apart those sort of three, at least three, different ways for explaining anatomical universals? Well, but I also think it's, it may not be neurons only, right? So are there are interactions uh, in other cellular or other parts, other organs that also show some of these principles? Very possibly, in which case it's not actually about the fact that it's neurons, right? It's more, it could be more general than that, which is why I posited energy, just that there, if there is an energetic constraint um, and an informational constraint, those two constraints are, are more general than neural systems. And so I don't, to, yeah, I guess you could then take the tack that if it's if these two features are common not just to neural systems but also to other organs, is it less interesting? I don't know. Um, it depends on one's perspective, I suppose. Then it would be more like saying there are constraints of development. Yes. Evo jibo type thing. Yes. And the fact that the brain is this information processing organ actually doesn't show up in the anatomical constraint. You can, you can sort of do it irrespective of that. Yes, yes. Or that, well, I, I was saying energy and information. The kind of information that the neural system has may be different than other kinds of information, but it may still be, abs could be extra abstracted to the same form. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how we would be able to distinguish those different explanations without um, more work done in other organs of the body, which I think is an important direction for the work to go. So um, you uh, have uh, made the remark here of the importance of energy, and obviously energy is primary. Um, and um, You've also, the talk has been about uh, to do with the structure and possible modularity of the neural network, but um, obviously that uh, needs to be integrated with the uh, energy networks. I mean, the circulatory system to the brain and how that integrates supporting all of this, yeah. which must put extraordinary constraints on the both the topological and physical structure of the neural network. Mm -hmm. So don't you have to do the same thing with the, with the circulatory system, the same structure, and then see how they interact and uh, yeah. in are integrated? Yes. Uh, because they are not independent. Of course, this is one of my biggest complaints always about neurobiology they forget that it actually has to be supplied by energy. Sorry, yeah. that's just an editorial. No. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree. No, we're working on a paper at the moment where we have estimates of cerebral blood flow so that we can assess something closer to um, the, the bringing of energy to specific regions of the brain. And so that allows us to ask questions about, well, is there something about the structure of the vasculature to the system that then helps us to understand the architecture of the network and how do those two um, connect with one another statistically. So we're working on that paper now. So I, that's just to indicate that I agree with you. Just a simple ironic comment, and that is, of course, we look at the brain with MRI and fMRI, which, of course, doesn't look at the energy part of the brain. I mean, it looks <laughs> yeah. at that other piece of the brain uh, and assumes that it is a reflection of the neural part of the brain. Yeah. Which it is in some, obviously is, but in some possibly quite nonlinear, complicated, complex way. Yes. I agree. But even from magnetic resonance imaging, you can acquire the bold signal, so blood oxygen level dependent signal, which is what most of the work does. Um, but yeah. then you can also estimate um, cerebral blood flow, like volume itself. Um, so there are different, and there's also arterial spin labeling, which sure. from which you can gather a little bit more information about blood flow too. So I think that um, there are, I think we need to do more work combining, even within MRI, those three different sequences to allow us to get closer to questions that assess the actual energy and the topology. Thank you. Thank you.